Okay, so I think we are live. So hi everybody and welcome to this Google Hangout on creating daily opportunities for self-care. My name is Hannah Brame and I really appreciate you taking the time today, uh, evening here, maybe it's the morning where you are, to join me for this webinar. We're going to spend the next 45 minutes, around about that amount of time, uh, unpacking ways that you can create opportunities for self-care in your daily life. So just to give you a quick introduction to who I am and what I do, just in case this is your first Google Hangout with me and it's the first time you've heard of me or Becoming Who You Are, um, I'm the founder of Becoming Who You Are, which you can find at becomingwhoyouare.net, where I teach people how to be kinder to themselves. I truly believe that if we were all a little bit kinder to ourselves, that would create a huge, dramatic shift and go a long way to solving a lot of the problems that we experience in our daily lives and a lot of the problems that we experience in our world as a whole as well. So I share ideas and I instigate discussions on self-kindness, creativity and everything in between through my blog, through podcasts, videos and webinars like this one that you are watching today. So this webinar is about self-care and the first question that I really want to address is why do we need to create opportunities for self-care in our daily lives? For a lot of us, self-care might feel like a luxury or something that we'll do when we have more time, when we have more money, when XYZ project is finished and so on and so forth. In reality, self-care is actually a necessity. I like to say that self-care is health care because if we don't have self-care, our emotional health suffers, our physical health suffers and it's generally not good. So if you've taken a flight anywhere, if you've been on an airplane uh, at any point, you'll probably remember the, the safety demo that all the attendants give at the beginning where they talk about how it's really, really important if the oxygen fails and the oxygen mask come down to put on your own mask first before helping other people. So this is true in emergency situations on airplanes and it's also true in our day-to-day -day lives as well. If we're not taking care of ourselves, there's a very, very limited amount that we are able to give to other people. And if we want to take care of other people in our lives, you know, if we want to really show up for our friends, our families, our partners, our colleagues at work, you know, in our job in general, um, in our leisure time, and just really make the most out of life, we really need to put that oxygen mask on for ourselves first and that is what self-care is all about. So that all sounds well and good but for many of us we don't actually feel like we have time to include self-care in our daily lives. We already have all these competing demands for our energy and time and the last thing we really want to do is to pile more of those on top of the big heap that probably already exists for you. I know it exists for me, certainly. So this webinar is going to be less about what you need to add to your life and more about how you can tweak your existing day-to-day -day life to add a little more self-kindness and self-care. I'm going to be sharing five ways that you can do this plus an opportunity to take your self-care practice even deeper with my upcoming course, which is from Coping to Thriving. And I'll be sharing more about that at the end of this Hangout. So here are the suggestions I'm going to be sharing with you in more detail over the next half an hour or so. Number one, look at what you're already doing. Number two, look at where you're spending time that doesn't serve you. Number three, Identify your non-negotiables. Number four, create a morning routine. And number five, remember that self-care is about meeting your needs. So as I go through these suggestions, you'll notice that they focus mainly on developing awareness. So that's awareness around your current habits and where you're spending your time, as well as awareness of the activities that really do nurture you as well as you know things that maybe don't. 
And the reason I'm starting with awareness on this webinar today and the reason that I start with awareness during week one of From Coping to Thriving is because we can't know what we don't know. I think that's really, really important. It sounds very obvious, but I think it's something that actually a lot of us forget sometimes, that we can't know what we don't know. Unless we know what we really need, and know what kinds of things meet those needs, we're not going to be able to do anything about those needs. You know, we're going to be stumbling around with a blindfold on, uh, taking random guesses about what kind of self-care activities are going to work for us, and probably getting it wrong as well, because we haven't really gone back and looked at what is underneath that need for self-care, that desire for self-care, what our actual specific needs are. When we identify an issue in our lives, it can be really tempting to rush out and take action and try to, quote, do something. But what we end up doing will be far more effective, as I said, if we take a pause and focus on building awareness around that area of our lives first. So that's going to be the focus this evening. It's going to be about building awareness. Once you have greater awareness around the points we're going to discuss, then you'll be far more able to take action on that awareness, and that action will get you a lot closer to where you want to be than if you simply acted randomly without doing the groundwork and laying the foundation first. So with that in mind, I'm just going to take a quick look at the Hangout window to see that it is working, and it looks like it is, which is very good. Um, and we're going to get straight to suggestion number one. So if at any point you have any questions during this webinar, feel free to type. I hope you can see a little box on the right-hand side of your webinar window um, called Group Chat, where you should be able to type in your questions. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to enter them in there. I will try and get to them, time permitting, at the end of this webinar um, and answer them to the best of my ability. If I don't have time, however, I will still respond to them um, on the group page. Uh, so the, the page for this Hangout, if that makes sense. I hope it does. <laughs> so yeah, feel free to fire your questions my way. And in the meantime, I'll go straight to suggestion number one, which is look at what you're already doing during your day. So according to a study published by Duke University in 2006, around 40% of the things we do during our day are not actually conscious decisions. They're habits. You know, we actually think we have far more control and autonomy in our lives than really we do. A lot of what we do during our day is a series of habitual actions that we've developed over time. So as we're looking to create more opportunities for self-care in our lives, a great place to start is by looking at what we're already doing and exploring where there might be room to add a little more self-kindness and a little more self-care to those areas of our life that already exist. So some of the most obvious examples, uh, or two of the most obvious examples, and the most important, I think, are eating and sleeping. How you approach these two things will probably have the biggest impact on how you feel physically, and as a consequence of that, the biggest impact on how you feel mentally and emotionally too. I know this is certainly the case for me. If I'm not eating right and if I'm not getting enough sleep, uh, I, my life just feels like it's going to pot, you know, even if it isn't objectively. I feel terrible physically. I feel really sluggish. Um, I'm less resilient than I am usually. I, I feel lower emotionally too. Um, it really, really has a huge impact. And it sounds really basic, and you might be sitting there thinking, oh, this is kind of obvious. But really do not underestimate how much of an impact eating and sleeping and the way that you go about those things and the care and attention you pay to those things, how much of an impact they will have on your life. So it's really, really important to examine how you're approaching these aspects of your life right now. And these, among other things, is really about what this first suggestion is, is what this first suggestion is about. So questions to consider are things like are you fueling your body in a way that is right for you do you eat clean so in other words do you eat um, natural unprocessed food uh, there's lots of uh, debate around you know which diet is healthiest and which diet is the best for everybody. Um, personally, I'm a big believer in doing what is right for you, listening to how your body responds to certain foods and going with that rather than um, buying into a certain sort of dietary approach that might or might not work for you. 
So along these lines, you can pay attention to things like which foods leave you feeling energized and which leave you feeling more weighed down and drained as well. Start to notice how what you put into your body affects how you feel. You know, start to notice also when you experience things like cravings and what those cravings might be for. And then also think about if time and money were no object, what would your ideal diet look like? And how does that differ to your diet right now? So once you've answered these questions, once you've taken some time to explore, you know, how you're approaching your relationship with food right now, how it could be different, uh, how you would ideally like to be approaching it as well, once you've done this groundwork, um, start really, really small. Again, you know, this webinar and self-care in general is not about making big, drastic changes to life. There's definitely a time and a place for big, drastic changes, but in general, uh, changes are far more um, sticky if we make a small change at a time. So what I'd invite you to do with this, if you look at your eating and you realize that actually, you know, I really have an opportunity for self-care in my eating, in the way I approach food, um, is to start to introduce one healthier meal a week into your diet. Um, so the first week, maybe start with one healthy meal. The second week, start with another two healthy meals and add another one on, another one on, until you're working your way closer to your ideal vision. So it's really about baby steps. But as I mentioned, the first step and what we're focusing on right now is developing that awareness around what is working for us and where we can show ourselves a little bit more self-care and self-kindness. Similar to food, you can explore sleep hygiene in a similar way. So questions that you might find helpful around this are how often do you rely on an alarm to get you out of bed? Um, I think this is a really interesting one and when I started exploring this for myself, this was a pretty huge revelation for me because I grew up with an alarm clock. I have always had an alarm clock uh, pretty much since I can remember and you know, I'm just used to it, I accepted it as a normal part of life, but the more I explored it, the more I realized that actually when we use an alarm clock, when we have to wake ourselves up or have something external waking us up, that's probably a sign that we're not getting as much sleep as we need to. And we all know that feeling of, you know, waking up, hearing the alarm go off and feeling this real struggle within ourselves of, oh, I'm so tired, but I've got to get out of bed. And it really takes a lot of willpower um, some mornings to do that. So look in your day-to-day -day life at how often you rely on an alarm clock to get you out of bed and why is that as well? Um, usually for most of us it's just that we're simply going to bed too late um, compared to the, the time that we want to get up. So not giving ourselves the, the seven and a half, the eight hours, the nine hours of sleep that we really naturally need. So how often do you rely on an alarm clock? How often does waking up just feel like a real struggle? You know, that struggle that I talked about that I think we're all too familiar with. Um, and then, you know, also things like how often do you keep phones, tablets, laptops right by your bed? So how often do you allow the electronics to seep into your room? I know that I am super guilty of this. <laughs> I find this really, really hard, um, mainly because, you know, some mornings when I have to get up for a coaching session or whatever, I, I usually don't use an alarm clock, but when I have to get up to go somewhere for a meeting, for a coaching session, I like to set a backup so that I charge my phone in my room. And it's really, really hard not to look at it first thing in the morning and last thing at night when it's there. Um, so look at your own habits around this as well. You know, there's so much research out there that shows how um, electronics are really, really bad for our, sleep, for our sleep quality. If we are looking at our iPad or looking at our laptop or our, our phone, the last thing before we get to sleep, um, it really affects how well we sleep and the quality of sleep we get. So I know it's a really hard habit to break, um, you know, things like changing our bedtime, shifting it up maybe half an hour or an hour earlier. These things can be really, really hard to get going with, but they do make all the difference to our quality of sleep. And as a result of that, our experience of our day-to-day -day lives as well. So it's really worth looking at that. I'm just going to take a sip of water. So sleeping and eating are just two of the things that you could explore. I'm raising them today just because for many of us, they are two of the things that, you know, we, we all need to sleep and we all need to eat. So these are things that we are doing every day anyway. And for a lot of us, they are things that we're not super conscious about. You know, we don't 
sometimes pay a huge amount of attention to what we're putting into our bodies, how much sleep we're getting. We tend to prioritize other things over these two really essential aspects of our life. So apart from these, to get started, I encourage you to keep track of what you spend time doing during your day. So just check in with yourself every hour, make a note of what you're doing, even if it's a mental note. Um, I do suggest you write things down, because often when we write things down, uh, we tend to get a different perspective on them. It can be really, really helpful to do that. Um, but even if it's just a mental note, just keep a tally of what you're spending your time on during your day and um, start noticing, like building that awareness that I talked about at the beginning. So for each activity that you do every day or that you spend significant time doing during your week, um, try asking yourself, if I were to add 10% more self-kindness to this activity, what would I do differently? So for each activity that plays a really significant part in your life, whether that's sleeping, eating, uh, spending time with people, working, um, sitting in front of the TV, you know, <laughs> whatever it is you spend a lot of your time doing. Um, ask yourself, if I were to add 10% more self-kindness to this activity, what would I do differently? So actually this water bottle is a great example <laughs> of um, some taking something that I was already doing and turning it into an opportunity for self-care. Um, so earlier this year, I was living in Mexico, and I was really good about drinking water then, um, just because you kind of have to be. It's really hot, it's really humid, and if you don't keep chugging the water, you soon start to get really dehydrated. But then when I came back to England, um, it's a lot cooler here, <laughs> a lot cooler, and you don't have that sort of need necessarily. You don't feel that same kind of dehydration at first if you're not drinking as much water as you would do in Mexico. So after a couple of weeks I noticed that actually I was getting quite dehydrated because I just wasn't being super conscious about my water intake. So um, a really easy way that I kind of added more self-care to something that I was already doing was to get this water bottle, it's BPA free, so there's no nasty chemicals, and it really makes it easy to keep track of how much water I'm drinking as well and make sure that I am getting as much as I need. On that note, I'm going to have another little sip. <laughs> All right. So suggestion number two is to look at where you're spending time in a way that doesn't serve you. So when we want to add something to our lives, we tend to go ahead and add it without remembering that our time and our energy are finite and that for everything we add to an already busy life, we also need to take something else away to make room for it. Otherwise, it's just piling stuff upon stuff upon stuff onto this big heap of commitments and demands and desires and needs and eventually our plate will completely overflow and that's not a fun situation to be in. I think we've all been there and we all know what that feels like. We all spend time doing things during our day that don't serve us. So if you're starting to feel like your plate is overflowing a little bit or you feel like your plate is pretty full but you want to make more time for self-care, this is a really good place to start looking. So going back to the statistic I mentioned um, about habits earlier, around 40% of our behavior can be on autopilot. It can be habitual. You know, we think we're in control of it, but actually it's a habit. It's something that's developed over time. And not all of those habits are good, as we all know. In fact, if you're anything like me, you probably find it much easier to develop uh, so-called bad habits or habits that aren't super good for us in the long term than you do to develop good habits or habits that are healthier for us in the long term. So as you keep track of how you're spending your time uh, with the suggestion uh, I mentioned just now, so keeping track of where you're spending your time during your week, what things take up a lot of your time, what are your really significant commitments, um, what do you do during your day, what activities do you invest your energy in? Um, as you keep track of those, just notice how you feel about them. Um, again, this might sound really obvious, but it's often something that we don't actually pay attention to, especially if we're on that autopilot. You know, for a great example of this is um, a really bad habit that I developed a while ago it was going on Facebook kind of just almost compulsively and habitually if I was getting uh, a little bit bored with what I was doing or I was doing something and uh, it was maybe a little bit anxiety provoking so I sort of ended up procrastinating 
my go-to way of procrastinating would be to click on Facebook and then just scroll through the same items on my newsfeed over and over again. And I feel a little bit embarrassed saying that because it's not something that I feel super good about. It was not a very constructive use of my time. Obviously, there's worse things that I could have done, but I think the key thing here is that I knew that this wasn't good for me because although I sort of got a little hit of relief in the moment, afterwards I would really not feel good about it. So that's why it's really, really important to, as well as keeping track of how we're spending our time, to notice how we feel about how we are spending our time and how we feel about the things that we're really investing our time and energy into. So as you evaluate how you're spending your time and look out for areas where you might be spending time on activities that don't serve you, it can be helpful to think about what your future self will most thank you for. So a question that I find really helpful, um, you know, when, I'm, when I want clarity around a situation, when I'm not sure what to do, when maybe I'm feeling some resistance, you know, around like going out for a run or doing a workout or sitting down to meditate and making that time, like creating that opportunity for self-care, um, a question that I find helpful is what will my future self most thank me for? And there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer to that question. Um, usually when I ask myself that, I find that my future self will most thank me for taking that time and carving out that time for myself. Um, so it's a really helpful question to check in with yourself and just notice what that future version of yourself, that sort of older, wiser version, what would they have to say about how you're spending your time today and what would they do differently or what would they encourage you to do differently. So suggestion number three is identify your non-negotiables. So what are non-negotiables? Our non-negotiables are the activities that leave us feeling like the best versions of ourselves. These are the things that when we do them, we are left feeling energized, we feel inspired, and we are ready to take on the world. When we fit these things into our day, life really feels like it's working. And we've all had days like that where we wake up, we're raring to go, um, everything just seems to work really, really smoothly. You know, there's maybe a couple of bumps in the road, but we're feeling so great. It doesn't matter. So that's what non-negotiables are really about, are cultivating that feeling of security, of stability, and of self-assuredness within ourselves. So uncovering our non-negotiables is an exercise that I do with most of my clients. And some of these things, some of the things that have come up really frequently for people that I've talked to about this um, include things like going outside, uh, getting some quality time in nature, journaling, having alone time, having time to be creative, exercising, uh, drinking a smoothie was one that came up quite frequently for clients as well, and so on. And so yours might be very, very different. I just offer those to give you an idea of you know, some of the things that you might want to include. Uh, my non-negotiables include things like exercise, meditation, journaling, and getting at least seven and a half hours sleep. I know that when I, when I do all those things in a day, and I have a couple more as well, but when I do all those things in a day, I feel really, really good. You know, my life is working when I can look back at sort of lunchtime or late afternoon and know that I did all of those things and I really took care of myself. As a sort of slight tangent, um, I think it's a really interesting thing that, you know, we feel, we can feel so much resistance to self-care. Um, but actually, self-care is incredibly rewarding when we get it right. So when we're doing things that are actually non-negotiables for us and that really meet uh, those needs for us, when we pay attention to what our unmet needs are in the moment, which I'm going to talk about in a second, and we really we do things that will really target those needs, when we do self-care right, uh, the very act of doing self-care, if I can say that, or living in a way that is self-caring is so fulfilling within itself. I think that's something that we, we don't sort of talk about as much as maybe we could do or appreciate or pay as much attention to. But I think it's a really, really important point that when we get self-care right, that in itself is really, really fulfilling, knowing that we're taking care of ourselves. You know, it's such a special gift to give ourselves. 
So coming back to the non-negotiables, like I know for myself that when I do these things, I can handle life's ups and downs with far greater resilience, as I mentioned earlier. And I, I generally have a much brighter outlook. You know, I, I mentioned earlier as well that when I don't get enough sleep, it really affects how I feel physically and emotionally. And I really, really notice those effects after a while. The funny thing is, I used to live my whole life like that. You know, I, I used to, especially a few years ago, uh, when I, I used to live in London, then I moved to cities, and for a while after I moved cities down to the coast, I was commuting back and forth to London every day to work. So I was spending like three hours on a train. My train in the morning left at 7 a.m. I don't like early mornings, <laughs> especially it was winter. It was really dark. It was dark when I left. It was dark when I got home. And um, I was just not getting enough sleep. You know, every morning I was having to drag myself out of bed to that alarm, um, partly because I didn't really feel like I had a life outside of work either. So I was trying to maximize my evenings. And it just got into this vicious cycle. And it's funny because I got so used to it at the time that coming out of that period when I started um, working down here for myself and uh, not using an alarm anymore, it was kind of funny to look back and realize how differently I felt. So wherever you are right now, if you know, if you recognize within yourself that maybe you have these non-negotiables that you're not meeting, um, even what feels normal to you right now probably isn't how good you could feel if you were paying attention to your non-negotiables, if you were meeting your needs, if you were doing basic things like eating right, getting enough sleep, etc. So there is, you know, it's like opening up this whole other level of uh, feeling alive and enjoying life and embracing life <clears throat> that we're not giving ourselves the chance to access if we don't pay attention to these things. What these activities are, so what your non-negotiables are, I, I gave you a few examples just then as, as examples to give you a couple of ideas to get you started, but what these activities are for you doesn't matter as much as how they leave you feeling. That's the really, really important part. As you unpack your non-negotiables, think about the activities that leave you feeling really good. So notice which activities leave you feeling ready to take on the world and create a list of the top five or so. Three to five is a good number to start with. And once you have these, you'll be ready to move on to the next suggestion, which is creating a morning routine. Before we get to that, I'm just going to have another little sip of water. And a little look, see if there are any questions. Doesn't look like it. Okay, brilliant. So creating a morning routine. Our mornings are really, really important. And again, you know, we all have mornings, right? Every day. It's something that we we all go through. Um, we all experience. We all have the same number of hours in a day. But I think the real difference as to how we experience our days depends on what we do with our mornings. So creating a morning routine that will set us up to have a really rocking day is a crucial act of self-care. And I know I mentioned at the beginning that most of the suggestions I'm focusing on about are about more tweaking what we're already doing in our lives. This one is slightly different because it is about sort of creating something new in our lives and adding something to our lives. Um, and this is the only suggestion I'm going to mention today that potentially involves adding something to your day. But hopefully with the previous suggestion of looking at where you're spending your time in a way that doesn't serve you, you might be able to identify some things you're spending your time on that aren't so great for you that don't leave you feeling good about yourself and about how you're spending your time and your energy. And consequently, you might be able to see some opportunities where you can free up a little more time for more self-caring activities. Um, so even if you haven't, you know, I appreciate I'm throwing a lot of information at you in this webinar so far. So even if you haven't sort of had thoughts about, oh, you know, where can I free up more time, I wonder. Um, this concept of developing a morning routine is 100% worth paying attention to and taking action on because it will make all the difference to how you experience your day as a whole. So routines and habits are useful because they work on a cue action reward system. So this is something that Charles Duhigg talks about in his book, The Power of Habit. Um, it's kind of the fundamental framework for 
how we create habits and also how we can change habits as well. Um, so if you're more, if you're interested in sort of habits and how to make them, how to how to change them, um, as he points out, you can't really break them. So uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that that is the case that um, psychology has proven. But um, if you're interested in that, I really really recommend checking out his book, The Power of Habits. It's a very interesting and enlightening read. So routines and habits work on this cue action reward system. So we feel the cue, um, which in the case of habits might be a craving or a desire to do something. Um, I'll just use a specific example to make it easier to understand. So a classic one is the sugar cravings, right? The, the afternoon donut, if you eat donuts. Um, let's use that one. So the cue is the sugar craving. The action is eating the donut. And the reward would be the sugar rush and the, I don't know, the, the kind of hormones and everything. I'm not a biologist, as you can tell. <laughs> the hormones and the, the whatnot that's released when you get the sweet taste on your taste buds. And then as the sugar goes into your system, the kind of, you know, the feel-good effect of that. Um, and so that's that's an example of the cue action reward system. And so with bad habits, this is a detriment because when we feel the cue and when we take action on that cue, that just reinforces the bad habit. But what this framework means is that we can actually use this to our advantage with positive habits, with habits that are really healthy for us. So the more we get used to having an awesome morning routine and the more we get used to starting our day with um, you know, I, I start my, my day with my non-negotiables. Some people have what they call a morning stack, which is literally a series of actions that they take every single morning in a specific order. Um, but when we can develop a habit or a routine like that and get used to having an awesome morning after taking part in our morning routine, the more effective that routine will become because as soon as we start that routine, so as soon as we start engaging in that first activity that, um, signals the beginning of our morning routine, the more our brains will start anticipating the feel good feelings coming up. So it's a really, really powerful habit to create this morning routine. In this way, consciously creating a morning routine allows us to set ourselves up for the best day possible. Now, of course, we can't control what life throws at us sometimes. You know, life is basically a series of ups and downs. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, with non-negotiables, part of the benefit that I get from them and part of the reason why they are so powerful is because when we practice, uh, whether it's non-negotiables or other things that you include in your morning routine, when we practice these diligently, we are taking control of what we can control. So regardless of what else is happening in our lives that is outside of our control, the main thing is that we are really, we're empowering ourselves, we're taking control of what we can control and giving ourselves the best opportunity we can to create a positive experience or as positive experience as we can have out of the next 24 hours ahead. So rather than, um, you know, a way of thinking about it is thinking about those, um, you know, those machines that they use in tennis courts for practice where it's just a, a ball machine that's firing ball after ball after ball. And we all see in the kind of comedy sketches and movies or um, I'm sure I saw a TV program once where one of these things goes haywire and starts like firing balls all over the place and the poor person there with a the tennis racket is sort of trying to um, fend, fend off all these balls that are flying at them. Um, life can feel a little bit like that sometimes. I don't know about you, but that's kind of the image that comes to mind for me. Um, and, you know, a great way of thinking about it is that during those times, if we don't have our non-negotiables in place, if we don't have a solid morning routine that's really setting ourselves up for a great day, if we're not dedicating that time to ourselves, it's like standing there without a tennis racket and having to kind of just like shield ourselves from all the stuff that's flying our way. Whereas if we have paid attention to our non-negotiables, if we have um, developed a solid morning routine and if we are really taking care of our needs, you know, we're standing there with like two tennis rackets like a boss and we are hitting these balls away from us. We are being way more resilient. We are far, far more in control of how we let these things that happen in our lives affect us. So this goes for the highs and the lows. You know, I was reading a book recently where um, I think 
it was The Language of Emotions by Carla McLaren, which is a really interesting book. Again, another one I recommend. And I'll, I'll try and remember to post all the links to those, these resources that I'm mentioning on the event page after this webinar is over. Um, but she talked about how um, when it comes to feeling joy and elation, actually we don't want to feel those things too often. We don't want to experience the really high highs. Um, what we what we want to do is almost sort of stay um, peaceful and calm, um, because the argument that she makes, as far as I remember it, is that you know if we sort of go too high above that uh, that stable place of feeling inner peace and calm, and that doesn't exclude happiness and joy and all of those things, um, but if we experience that really extreme elation, then inevitably at some point we will come down from that and we will experience. Um, lower feelings as a result afterwards. Uh, and she makes the point, um, she, she kind of goes into a lot more detail about it and explains it in a much better way than I'm explaining it here. But um, she talks about how, you know, we really want to develop more uh, emotional resilience to the high highs and the low lows of life. And that's really what we're talking about here. So we all have the same amount of time each morning, which means that we can use this time to create an opportunity for self-care, as, as we've just been talking about. So this is where your awareness of your non-negotiables will be really, really helpful. Um, most, in fact, all of my morning routine, um, with the exception of sort of showering and having breakfast, um, involves my non-negotiables. So I get most of my non-negotiables out of the way before I sit down and do anything else in the morning and it really, really makes a huge difference. So you, you can experiment, you can start to use the activities that you identify as non-negotiables to start creating a, an activity stack for your morning. Um, so maybe starting with some journaling, then some meditation, then some exercise, that's the way I do it, um, before you head out to work. But you don't need to squeeze all your non-negotiables into the morning. <clears throat> it can be really helpful. Um, I personally recommend it if you can. Uh, just because it really does give you a great start to the day. However, I appreciate that everybody has different schedules. It might not be possible for you to do that. Um, so shuffle things around, experiment, and try out sort of different puzzle pieces and see how they're going to fit together and create a morning routine that works for you. As I said with non-negotiables, the actual activities that you do are not as important as how they leave you feeling. That is the really, really key thing here. So moving on to suggestion number five, which is the final suggestion. And this is about remembering that self-care is all about meeting your needs. So this suggestion and the final suggestion that I want to share with you this evening really brings us back to what self-care is about, which is making sure that we're meeting our own needs, as I've mentioned a couple of times throughout this webinar. So wherever you are right now and whatever you're doing during your day, simply stopping to ask yourself, what do I need right now, can have a really powerful impact on your self-care practice. Again, something that's incredibly simple, really doesn't take a lot of time or energy. It's just a question of stopping and asking yourself, what do I need? It's just a question of really giving yourself a window of opportunity to listen to uh, what your body and what your mind is telling you. Because our bodies and our minds are telling us what we need all the time. It's just that we are rarely listening to what they really, really have to say. You know, we're distracted with external things. We're focused on work or we're focused on a conversation we're having or we're focused on our phone or listening to music. You know, we have all these external distractions that are taking our attention away from our internal selves. So consequently, we don't have much of an opportunity to really listen in. So this, this suggestion is about consciously creating those opportunities and making a practice out of asking that question, what do I need right now? Because when we do that and when we open up that window and that awareness, we are enabling ourselves to listen out for the answers to that question. And again, like I said earlier, when we know the answers to that question, when we know what am I really needing right now, what unmet needs do I have, our self-care is going to be way more effective because after, as a follow-on from knowing what our needs are, we can then think about, well, what is going to meet that need for me right now? What can I really do? Rather than just kind of stumbling around blindly, trying different things and then giving up because none of them work. 
So the answers to this question might not come immediately, especially if we are very used to being distracted by external things and we're not so used to introspection, to really listening to ourselves. But um, even if the answers don't come immediately, stick with asking yourself this question because the more we practice asking that question, the more we practice checking in with ourselves on a daily basis, um, the more likely we are one day to start hearing the answers. So as I mentioned earlier, this is really where we start going from coping to thriving. When we keep doing things that we know aren't good for us, like drinking slightly too much, eating too much, uh, eating things we know are bad for us but feel cool to eat anyway, um, compulsively checking email or Facebook, as I talked about earlier, uh, zoning out in front of the TV, you know, and doing things unconsciously that aren't good for our physical or mental health in the long term. What we're doing when we do those things is that we are trying to meet our needs. You know, there is an unheard part of us that has a need that we are trying to meet unconsciously through doing those things. Um, those ways of meeting that need or those attempts to meet that need might not be very productive or very good for us, but it's an unheard part of us trying to meet it in the best way it knows how. You know, if we're not consciously listening out to what our needs are, we still have those needs, they don't go away. They just get diverted into all these activities where afterwards we're like, why do I keep doing that? I don't understand why I keep, uh, why I've developed this habit, why I keep feeling compelled to do X, Y, Z. Um, if you find yourself asking those questions, there's a very, very strong chance that what is underneath is an unmet need. And by doing those things that you don't understand or that you don't like or that you don't feel good about, that's the part of you that you're not listening to. Um, or that you just haven't sort of given yourself a chance to hear yet that is trying to meet that need for you and doing it in an unconscious way. So if we can uncover what those needs are and if we can bring them up to a conscious level, then we have a much better chance of meeting them in a healthier way in the future. And that's what this process is really, really about, is it's about making the unconscious conscious and making sure that whatever we're doing with our self-care is specific, it's conscious, and it's for our, it's for our general health. You know, it's, it's for a brighter future. Um, it sounds a bit of a cliche, but that's the way it feels, right? It's for really making the most out of life and making sure that we are showing up as the best version of ourselves and as the healthiest, happiest versions of ourselves to do so. So whenever you're unsure about what self-care might look like on any given day or how to be kinder to yourself, remember that you can always return to the question, what am I needing right now? Just stop and ask yourself that question. Um, after this webinar, another link that I will share with you is a link to a needs inventory. This is from the website of the Center for Nonviolent Communication. Um, and this is a super helpful resource for answering this question. Um, sometimes when we ask questions like that, if we're not used to the lingo, the needs language or the needs vocabulary, um, we can completely draw a blank just because we don't know how to express what we're experiencing in words. We don't know how to put it into words in a way that we understand it and can do something about it as well. So I'll share this needs inventory with you. Um, I used to have this pinned up on my wall as a go-to reference when I checked in with myself and it really helped expand my vocabulary and deepen my connection with myself. So I really hope it's useful for you too. So those are the five suggestions I have to share with you today. I'll just recap them again quickly at the end because I'm aware that we have covered a lot of ground in this webinar. And uh, if you're sitting there feeling a little bit uh, like maybe overwhelmed, <laughs> I hope not, but um, like there's more that you could get out of this. I really encourage you to go back and watch the video, the replay of this afterwards. Um, so the five suggestions I've shared are number one, look at what you are already doing and find ways you can tweak it. Number two, look at where you're spending time that doesn't serve you. Number three, identify your non-negotiables. So those activities that leave you feeling on top of the world like the best version of yourself. Number four, create a rocking morning routine. And number five, remember that self-care is about meeting your needs and remember that you can always go back to that question, what am I needing right now? As I mentioned, if you would like to take the topics we've talked about here tonight further and revolutionize your relationship with self-care and your own relationship with yourself, 
I invite you to check out uh, my upcoming course, From Coping to Thriving. So this is a six-week course that is starting next Monday, which is Monday the 15th of September, and it will give you greater insight and awareness into your current habits and how to introduce more self-care into your daily life. So it will be a continuation of what we started talking about tonight. It's a huge topic, so we've scratched the surface today, but over the six weeks of From Coping to Thriving, you'll be able to dive a lot deeper into this. Um, it'll also give you a framework that you can use going forward to replace bad habits with more self-caring behaviors. Uh, it'll give you deeper connection, greater self-knowledge, and the sense of peace and possibility that comes with both of these things. And finally, you'll get a toolbox of practical resources and actionable ideas that are yours to keep and use indefinitely. So as I mentioned, the course is six weeks. I'll just give you a really quick breakdown of what you can expect to see in each week and how the structure of the course plays out. So week one, as I mentioned earlier, week one is really about the foundation. So what is self-care and what does it look like for you? During this week, we'll lay the foundations of a sustainable self-care practice. We'll explore things like your values and your needs, so really fundamental self-awareness work. And we'll identify your current coping strategies, so those things that I talked about earlier that we do that, um, that we know aren't very good for our health in the long term, but we sort of feel compelled to do anyway. Um, so we'll identify your current coping strategies and the habits that you would ideally like to shift in the long term. So week two, we'll dive deeper into the topic of coping strategies and look at what they are and how they develop. And you'll also learn more about how habits work and what we need to do to shift them. So again, that's something that we started talking about tonight, that um, Q action reward uh, framework, but we'll dive deeper into that on the course. So then week three, we'll look at long-term self-care. Uh, so these are our most basic needs. You know, I mentioned sleeping and eating earlier, um, and these are just two of the the needs that I call long term that fall under the banner of long term self care, or what I call long term self care. So these are the foundations of our self care, and they play a huge role in making the transition from coping to thriving. Through satisfying our most fundamental needs, we give ourselves a much better chance of switching our coping strategies to self-caring behaviors. So we'll dedicate week three just to looking at that type of self-care. So that includes things like um, the sleeping and eating that I talked about earlier, as well as some other really basic things like uh, stopping to breathe, you know, really, really basic things like that that we do anyway in our lives, but usually we don't do in a very, very conscious way. Week four is short-term self-care. So we looked at long-term self-care the, the week before, then we're going to move on to short-term self-care, and this will build on the process that we started in week three. Um, so then during this week, we'll be focusing directly on how to use self-care to shift some of those coping strategies that we want to switch. We'll talk about the tipping point and what it means to our self-care choices for us practical ways that we can help ourselves integrate self-care into our daily lives. So carrying on in week five in the penultimate week we will focus on creating a sustainable self-care practice so this is really cementing all the work we've done so far in the course and making self-care an integral part of your life in a way that works for you you know I really I don't use a cookie cutter approach on this course I don't believe in that I think everybody is different and so um, I'll be exploring with you how you can balance long-term and short-term self-care plus discuss what a consistent self-care practice looks like in reality for you. Finally, week six, um, which is called Onwards and Upwards. <laughs> um, this is the last week of the course, and it will be about continuing the valuable work that you've started. So during this week, we'll talk about some of the most common obstacles to self-care that you might encounter and how you can work through them, and you'll end with the tools and resources you need to create a life based on self-kindness and compassion. So that's the basic structure. As far as the logistics go, the course consists of emails. You also get an individual coaching call with me and three group coaching calls where we all come together and do a workshop. There's time for 
um, live Q&A, stuff like that. And so that will happen over the six weeks. It's a really, really wonderful way to devote some time and attention to the most important relationship in your life, which is your relationship with you, <laughs> and also to connect with like-minded people who are on a similar journey to you. So if you'd like to join us, you can go to bit.ly slash coping to thriving. That's the short link you can use. Or click on the link I will include on the webinar event page after this is over. Um, so remember that the course is starting on next Monday, which is Monday the 15th of September. So you have until 12 a.m. Pacific time Monday to register. So that's it for tonight. I will just do one final check for questions. And if you are listening right now, if you have any questions that you haven't asked yet but would like to ask, um, you have approximately two minutes to type something really quickly and uh, drop it in the group chat. Um, I really appreciate you showing up tonight and um, watching. Please feel free if you have any questions about anything I've discussed tonight about from coping to thriving or anything else to do with your self-care practice, um, please feel free to email me at hannah, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. Um, if you're part of the tribe, um, so the Becoming Who You Are community, um, you can also feel free to post in the Facebook group for the tribe as well, and I will respond to you there. So doesn't look like there are any questions, so I'm going to say thank you once again. Really appreciate you showing up tonight. Um, I hope this webinar has served your self-care practice, and I really hope it's given you um, at least a starting point from which you can start to integrate self-care more into your daily life and create these opportunities for self-care um, using the life that you already have. So not necessarily needing to add anything, it's just looking at what you already have, what you can tweak and what you can create from what already exists. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it and most of all, I hope you have a lovely morning, day, evening, wherever you are in the world and I will talk to you again very soon. Okay, thank you. Bye.